Westminster Abbey, at the heart of a nation for a thousand years. Edward III is over there, Richard II is over there. Be it weddings or coronations, the Abbey is the royal church. It's better our fingers get thorns than the royal fingers. But behind the pomp and circumstance... Mother of God, stand, you know, still singing, everything wonderful, beautiful and lovely. ...is the spit, polish and perfectionism... You can spend too long being perfect. There we go, that'll do. ...of the folk who make it happen. I might just drop this now. From the altar to the crypt... Anything that the clergy need, that's what we're here for. Oh, sorry, 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 excuse me. ...from the nave to the roof... The things you do for the Abbey. It all runs on meticulous planning. It's a live service. Everything has to be absolutely perfect. ...and a wing and a prayer. Don't work with children, don't work with animals, don't work with candles. Welcome to Westminster Abbey. This time, timing is of the essence for Rouge. The bells start ringing just as the royals exit the abbey. And also for minor canon Bob. Oh, look at that. It is a bit of a challenge to organise and make sure that 40 people are doing the right thing at the right time. There's nothing you can do at the end of the day. Just keep smiling. Keep looking at the watch. And the Abbey's Jubilee celebrations are on the brink. Oh, oh, no. oh! It's 9am and in Westminster Abbey's Northwest Tower, the bell ringing team are standing by. Come on, guy. Come on. And the Abbey bells ring out in celebration of Queen Elizabeth II's 96th birthday. And inside the Abbey, the specialist heritage cleaners are at work. Over at St. Edward's Shrine, Hannah is giving one of the medieval royals some TLC. So I'm dusting Henry V. You do feel like you're cleaning the sleep from his eyes or <laughs> brushing the hair. If you'd brush it with the same amount of pressure, you would a person. <laughs> this one can't complain, but... Immortalised by Shakespeare, Henry V is famed as the victor of the Battle of Agincourt. But the tomb that has pride of place at the Abbey does not belong to a king or a general, but an ordinary soldier. I'm going to clean the Anno Warrior. We do this every morning three times a week. Victoria's cleaning the grave of a single, unidentified serviceman killed on the Western Front during the First World War. It's not really about war, it's more about... Uh, remember whoever is actually lost his life to preserve uh, our freedom, our democracy. The focus for memorials such as Remembrance Sunday, the grave has come to stand for all servicemen and women killed in battle. Recently, Clerk of the Works' Ian Bartlett made an intriguing discovery that might add a new chapter to the story of the unknown warrior. So behind me you can see one of the most popular and revered memorials we have in the Abbey. But what many people don't know is there one previous to this while this one was being made. It just so happens, when we were doing the Lord Haywood Memorial, we lifted the, the, the stone up, and lo and behold, part of the original um, memorial stone was there. The first unknown warrior stone was laid two years before the current memorial. Thanks for coming up, Tony. Ian has now enlisted the head of collections, Tony Trolls, to help him try and track down the missing piece of this historic object. One of my favourite places up here. Isn't it beautiful? It's amazing, isn't it? The Abbey's storeroom is a treasure trove of forgotten objects. So I'd like to show you a stone that we took up in the cloister. So here it is, Tony. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember now. What's the history, do you know? Well, the the grave of the unknown warrior, of course, is, is one of the most recognisable things in the Abbey. Yeah. And everybody knows that black marble gravestone. But when that burial took place here in 1920, the first stone that was put down was, was this stone. <laughs> 
this is half of the stone that originally covered that grave after, after the burial. So this was, as it were, a temporary stone with a much simpler inscription, but actually a very powerful it is. inscription, I think, for king and country, greater love hath no man than this. Very, very poignant. The other half, it's going to be quite a big piece. It is it? going to be quite a big piece. I'm thinking it's somewhere up here. I guess so, yes. Oh, hey. Heavy? Yep. <laughs> Nothing is wasted at the Abbey, so the missing part may have been reused somewhere on site. Yeah, it's quite distinctive, isn't it? It, it that, is quite that. distinctive and quite heavily <laughs> riven for a stone, so... Let's hope we can find it. But finding another stone with the same distinctive pattern is not going to be easy. The size of the Abbey and the size of the estate. <laughs> you can imagine how much space there is and how many stones that look alike there are. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. The tourists may throng around the grave of the unknown warrior in the nave, but only a tiny fraction enter the secret realm of Jan Pankeri, the Abbey's head gardener. Most people have no idea that Westminster Abbey has gardens, let alone all these secret ones in the cloisters and this beautiful, very old garden that the um, monks used to garden. The garden is Jan's passion, and it's one she's about to share. For the first time this year, we're doing tours in the summer to introduce people to the garden, which we've not really done before. Just spread yourself, make yourself as comfortable in the garden. These tours are part of the Abbey's Jubilee celebrations and also a new source of much-needed revenue. I'm Jan Pankeri. I'm the head gardener here. And I've been at the Abbey for about over 20 years or something, a long time. But having dedicated so much of her life to this garden, it's not money that Jan is looking for from her visitors. Well, that's just as important as gardening, is having somebody to appreciate it. So we're in the herb garden now. Ever since I've been here, I've wanted to try and reflect the fact that it'd been a monastic garden at one time. So this is the herbs that they would have had. There's marjoram and sage, mints, that one. It's called um, costumery or ale cost. And this is what they used to use for uh, making um, ale before they had hops. You know, the monks had to drink a lot of ale. They were allowed to have up to eight pints a day because they couldn't sterilize the water any other way. But it's a very bitter tasting leaf. It doesn't taste that nice. <laughs> Clark of the Works Ian is still on his own Abbey tour as he hunts for the missing half of the first unknown warrior stone. And he's now narrowing down his search. I've been looking around and somewhere in this cloister is the one we're looking for. And now he's decided to call in his masonry team to take a closer look. That stone was seen by so many people. It was part of that very first outpouring of remembrance and, and griefs that, that came in the wake of the burial in 1920. So it's a very remarkable thing to have. And we very much hoped we could find the other half. It's the 25th of April, and today the grave of the unknown warrior will become the focus of a royal service. So, the national anthem is sung, then uh, New Zealand, if you could lead. As rehearsals are underway for Anzac Day, which commemorates the servicemen and women of Australia and New Zealand who have died in battle. You're not quite central. The man directing today's manoeuvres is Mark Birch. I'm afraid the tiles don't help you very much. There's a lot of preparations that goes into it. That's why the job of minor canon in the Abbey is so important because they are the people who prepare all of it. They're the directors of that particular movie. Could you just about turn in your places? Perfect. Anzac is always on the anniversary of one of the bloodiest battles of the First World War, Gallipoli. This is the moment when Australia and New Zealand uh, enter the world stage. These young countries send armies uh, to fight alongside British troops. Uh, they join uh, a world war. And for, for both countries, it's a sort of coming in, of age. Uh, they also, because Gallipoli was carnage, they also describe it as a baptism in blood. Out in the Abbey Garden, 
the tour is heading for Jan's favourite spot. So this is a greenhouse that was built in 1929. <laughs> Jan is busy sharing her enthusiasm for the garden. There's not many greenhouses that have medieval wall at the back. So this wall dates back to um, 1376. But so far, reactions have been muted. But obviously, it widens our scope so much because we can grow much more variety of plants from seed than we could from buying them from a nursery. And also, it's much more ecologically friendly. And perhaps her next hidden gem will get a response? So this is a garden now, but it used to be a chapel. So if you can try and imagine there's a roof over, the, over your head. It's a very nice, uh, peaceful space in here, I think, because nobody ever really comes in here. Beautiful garden. OK, well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. <laughs> it's the words Jan has been waiting to hear. And inside the abbey, minor canon Mark is rehearsing his cast. Ben, can you be the dean, please? Verger Ben is called in for a cameo role. It's the first time I've been the Dean. And I've got some great co-stars as well. I'm aiming for an Oscar, Best Standing Dean. Seating protocol is key for the Anzac service, as it's always attended by a royal. So Lorraine is making sure that all the seats are marked correctly, so that is that's a crucial job, obviously. Today it's the turn of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. It's a really big day in the, in the Abbey calendar. It is also my birthday, <laughs> so, so, it, so it means my birthday is always a busy day. <laughs> Organ starts, quick march. Australia, then Turkey, then UK. Birthday boy Mark will be hoping that practice will eventually make perfect. Do you want to stop and do the delivery and retrieval again? And Rusha's timing must be spot on. If I get the signalling right, the bells start ringing just as the royals exit the abbey. And the royals will soon be on their way. At the abbey, there's a hunt in progress. Clerk of the Works Ian is searching for a missing stone, the lost half of the original Unknown Warrior Memorial. It's quite distinctive, isn't it? It, it is quite distinctive. And he seems to have struck lucky. So I've been looking around in this cloister, and I believe I found it. The top side is identical. Ian sets his stonemason team to work. If this was the one that I'm, I'm thinking about, it would be amazing. We'll lift it and see if we're right or wrong. Only slightly nervous. And he's invited Tony, head of collections, along to witness the moment of truth. I'm itching to look at it now. I'm just getting more and more nervous by the second. After searching the abbey high and low, Ian's hopes are dashed. Well, that's a disappointment. It is a disappointment. Oh, well, we're going to find another Can't one. Can't take them all up. Yes. Who says that? <laughs> well, thanks, guys. So the hunt continues. The hunt continues. Yeah. We've got, um, which one should we pick next? Yeah, that's quite a lot. <laughs> well, it must be here, but somewhere. It must because... be here, yeah. I had high hopes that that was the one, but I'll still keep looking. Just try and complete the jigsaw of two pieces. Today it's Anzac Day at the Abbey. Just need to have your tickets ready, please. And the congregation is starting to arrive for this special royal service. Today we're going to get ambassadors from New Zealand, from Australia, some members of Parliament, Prince William, Kate. They'll be here. They're always the last people to come in. It's Kirsty and the Beadle's job to make sure the right people go through the right door. What colour tickets do you have? Yellow, yes. I just keep going. It's great. <laughs> She's developed her own personal ticketing technique. I like the pink, blue and purple, so it's easy to remember. And the colours I don't like, orange and yellow, so uh, that way. Whilst the Beatles do their checks... Yellow is straight on. Rouja is psyching herself up for her own important role. So this is where the bell tower is, and that's where the uh, signal system is for the bell ringers. And we've got um, just one button that I need to press. If I press it once, it signals the bell ringers to get ready. And then I wait for uh, the procession to reach the grave of the unknown warrior. 
and then I press the button twice and hope for the best. Her timing needs to be impeccable as the bells must chime exactly as the royal couple leave through the Great West Door. And up in the tower itself, Daniel. the Abbey's bell ringers are getting ready. We're all here. We're all here. Jeremy, their conductor, is starting to feel the pressure. The royals leaving the Abbey would always notice the bells, not least because they're probably trying to talk to somebody outside. They can be very nerve-wracking because Nobody sees you, but by golly, they hear you. He heads to the bell chamber for a final check. The rope, you can see, is tied in the middle of the bell. So when the ringer pulls the rope down, that will cause the bell to move in a complete circle. The clapper has followed the bell, and it actually hits the bell right at the end of the cycle. So there's about two seconds between pulling the rope and your bell actually sounding. You have to be quite precise as to when you pull it. Whilst most of the Abbey team are busy preparing for the service. Okay, so Martin leaving the Dean and their Royal Highnesses. There's one rather specialized task to do. I'm just gonna head down to what we call the crypt. It's where the Abbey store a lot of its precious textiles. This area is very vulnerable to insect pest damage, so we have it in a red zone. Soon the Dean and the Canons will be donning their ceremonial best, and it's conservator Lucy Ackland's job to ensure their clothes are not holy in the wrong kind of way. So, this is called a pheromone moth lure, and it's impregnated with the pheromone of the female moth. As you can imagine, the poor old male moth will go towards this and obviously get stuck. It's their larvae rather than the actual adult moth that does the damage to your jumpers and stored objects. They are incredibly clever and they've really taken hold, unfortunately, in London and the southeast. Whilst moths munching on your favourite jumper might be upsetting, having them snack on gold and silk historic vestments is on a whole other level. These are Charles II's funeral coats. Looking for any evidence that there might be of um, insect uh, activity. So if it was the clothes moss, you might see a little silk there webbing, basically, that they weave, but also what's called the frass, which is actually um, what they produce, um, their excrement, if you like. Copa investments are clear. This is a very important cupboard. Made of velvet and silk, with silver and gold thread, many of these altered clothes are over a century old. So on, on a dorsal cloth like this, the fringing here particularly, I will look for any evidence because it's an ideal place for insect pests and larvae to hide. Thanks to Lucy, this is one area in London where the moths are actually in retreat. With the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge now on their way to the Abbey. So we'll go out in a minute uh, to sort of starting positions. The senior clergy, resplendent in their moth-free garb, have gathered for a pre-service briefing. You'll take the Duke down the presentation line. Anthony, you'll take the Duchess. There'll be a posy on the north side yeah. for the Duchess. the Duchess. Not for you, Anthony, it's for the Duchess. <laughs> Disappointing. <laughs> Disappointing. We ought to, actually, we ought to, we really ought to go. As the last VIPs arrive, Martin, the Dean's verger, is keeping a lookout for the most important dignitaries. On cue, the Dean goes out to greet his royal guests. The Gallipoli landings on April the 25th in 1915 did not proceed to plan. It was long and it was relentless six days fighting before the Anzacs were relieved. As the standards process up to the high altar, it's clear that Mark's rehearsals have paid off. Finally, over at the grave of the unknown warrior, it's time to honor the dead.
And it's time for Rusha to signal the bell ringers. Hang on. Normal start. Look two. And as the royals emerge, the bells are right on cue. And the right person receives the posy. We've got an amazing service, bells are ringing, joyful atmosphere. It's a place for everyone in the heart of London. Welcome to Westminster Abbey. Yeah, well. With the Abbey still reeling from the financial impact of the pandemic, the visitor experience team have been asked to find new ways to bring in extra cash. Any language preference? Portuguese. Portuguese? Portuguese. Portuguese? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Head of visitor experience, Scott Craddock, came up with the idea of showing visitors a part of the Abbey that's previously been strictly off limits. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Together with the Clerk of the Works, Ian, Scott has been planning and honing this special Jubilee roof tour, ready for paying visitors. How was your roof tour with Ian? Yeah, it was incredible. So you get the most amazing views. So you've got Parliament all behind, you've got like a lot of the skyline of London, the wow. city, and then we were on the top of the Lady Chapel roof. Oh, you got some pictures? Yeah, Excellent. I took this picture. That is the lady chapel below with and you can see visitors below you so you're literally standing above them they don't know you're there and you can look down and see them that's amazing like a spy hole it is that's yeah. brilliant the tour may have amazing locations but it's being led by the abbey's clerk of the works yeah right, guys how's it going an expert when it comes to buildings maintenance but as a tour guide a complete novice so scott has organized a trial run for him point all that out. If you've got any questions at all, Ian would love to answer all of those. Thanks. <laughs> With a test audience of pro tour guides, Ian has got a tough crowd to please. Are you ready? As I'll ever be. On the ground floor, preparations are underway. It's chair o'clock, as we call it. Um, so they're putting out all the chairs uh, at the moment, finishing that off. It's an intense job. But today's service is not to honour a royal or a VIP. It's for the nation's nurses. And Verger Alice is picking up a key prop. So this is the, the lamp that gets used at the service. We have a lamp because Florence Nightingale was known as the Lady of the Lamp. The founding figure of professional nursing, Nightingale first became known for her care of injured soldiers in the Crimean War. She used to patrol the wards uh, with a lamp around midnight, making sure everything was all right. It'll be a complex service that needs careful planning. And chairing the meeting is minor canon Bob Latham. OK, this is Florence Nightingale. My focus is the beginning of the rehearsal, for which we have 31 student nurses and seven scholars um, at a partridge, very much in a pear tree. Um, so it's a lot of people to organize. This is the last internal planning meeting that we have before we issue a set of ceremonial notes. There are a detailed schedule of what's happening and it is minute by minute. We leave nothing to chance. So the order I've got here is, is I mean, I, I, it's the, not correct. No, it's not correct. So I've corrected it this morning, about half an hour ago. <laughs> right. It's clear that there's still work to be done. And how will the roof tour rehearsal go down? Ian and Scott are about to find out. We're just going to have a dry run of our roof tour. Ian and Scott are, are taking a few of us up to see how it's all going and if there are any improvements that need to be introduced to the tour. Very exciting. I've never been to the roof. So on our practice tour today, we've got two or three members of staff that haven't been up on the roof before, so we want their first reactions. Just stepping in between on the bay, not the rolls. But for Ian, it's a bit of a stumbling start. I know some things about the House of Parliament, rough dates of construction, and we've got four visitor experience people from Parliament. So they're, they're re 
professionals in, in visitor management. First test for Ian. Does he know when the Houses of Parliament were built? I think it was finished in 1860. 1870. Eh? The last half yeah. of the last bit. It was 1870, OK. Well, I fluff that one. I'll just, I'll just make something up. It's not exactly the flying start Scott and Ian were hoping for. I think they probably would enjoy more of the structural things, perhaps. Just a little bit more about the way the Abbey was built. So, just some feedback so far. Anything we need to look out for? Perhaps maybe a little bit longer for people to look around. OK. He may not know all his history dates, but when it comes to measurements... Most of our rooms are 600 mil thick. This, at most, is sort of 70 millimetres thick. Ian is definitely on firmer ground. So, if you'd like to come over, we'll have a look down. So, can you see down that hole? Yep. As you can see people below. They've got no idea we're here. No. No, absolutely none. Part way through, and it's not all bad news for the rookie tour guide. Down in the nave, Bob is about to put 30-plus nurses through their paces. Maybe his dry run will go a little better? Right, could I just... Can you, it's a bit like being at school, sorry, just because I don't know you and you don't know me. I just want to see visually who's here. Forest Lighting Girl Service, celebrating nursing and midwifery. Logistically, it's quite complicated. But yeah, Bob is handling it all with amazingly good grace and patience and humour, which is, which is the real key. Come forward. Could I have two of you on this side lining up directly behind uh, Leone, please? Yeah, thank you. And the other two, please, to line up behind Joshua. Director Bob now calls on Alice to be his mistress of props, and the woman with the honour of carrying the lamp in the service is Nurse Colette. Here's the lamp. It's a particular way to hold it. Um, we're going to light it just before the service, so it could be quite hot. Yeah. So I suggest you hold it by the base. Is it there a particular way to turn it? Carry it how you feel okay. comfortable. Yeah. Many nurses have carried it before you and they've been fine. Okay. <laughs> You'll be fine. I feel nervous. I absolutely want to get this really important job right. I just think it's just such a lovely celebration for all of us as, as nurses. It makes us feel special and valued. Oh, look at that. Um, we have a lamp and it's lit. Brilliant. OK, so this looks amazing. You may not know that, but it does. We are going to do uh, a rehearsal now. Be proud. Enjoy this moment. This is not sombre. This is really uplifting and important. There is a skill and an art to procession. You have to get the pace exactly right. This one's got the added interest of the lamp. That's quite difficult carrying something that's a flame. The challenge is to get them all to walk very slowly down and then to peel off at the right time and sit in the right places. It is a bit of a challenge to organize and make sure you know, that 40 people are doing the right thing at the right time. Now, what's going on there? Can we come back again, please? Sorry, can we come back again? Right, they should be split. Okay, lovely. Mother of God, stand, you know, still singing, everything wonderful, beautiful, and lovely. Well done, everyone, that looks really good. 80 feet up, things have started to improve. That is what used to be Scotland Yard, um, so the, the office box there, heading down into Victoria Street. A bomb came down through there in, on May the 11th, 1941. Did the same bombing raid? Um, yes. The Parliament. Absolutely, yeah. the, the same night. The yeah, yeah. The tour is virtually done. I'm going to take you all the way back down to the gallery. <laughs> I think slightly slower start perhaps than to expect there's some bits and pieces of course dates and uh you know details that perhaps need to be double checked i hope you enjoyed the tour um, and thank you so much for your feedback you are kind of our guinea pigs for this one so i hope you've had uh, a really enjoyable visit Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. scott and ian have some work to do as next time the tour is for real but downstairs, 
Minor Canon Bob is getting into his stride. And then somebody called the Reverend Robert Latham, who's me, will say from the far end, let us remember those nurses and midwives who answered God's call, and this is where it begins to get very solemn, the hairs on the back of your neck will go up. Bob is now rehearsing with the nurses whose job it is to carry the roles of honour. It signifies real commemoration and, and thought and consideration for those that have given so much during this pandemic, those that have lost their lives. What I'd like you to recognise, I'm sure you will, you'll feel it in the moment, you can't fail but feel it in the moment, is that this is incredibly solemn. Uh, so this need, you need to leave with that in mind. As well as honouring British nurses, the service pays tribute to medical staff from further afield. Come down here, that's, that's perfect. My name is Irina Vieira, and I've been in UK 26 years. I originally came and been trained as a nurse from Ukraine. I have been asked to read a prayer dedicated to all people who are supporting or suffering in Ukraine. Well done, everyone. Goodness me, we've got one minute left of our rehearsal time and we are done. Uh, thank you so much. You know, it's, it's all so much stuff on a piece of paper. Once you actually start saying the words and, and marking it out on the ground, the impact of what you're doing and why you're doing it and who you're doing it for really strikes you. And if it's like that in rehearsal, you wait till the service. Unexpected moments. Extraordinary stories sponsored by Prestige Flowers on Channel 5. Fast forward to December 2023 and a lot has changed. Some things are more than others. A lot can change in the year except for gift gas prices, which are fixed until the end of 2023. The centre of the Abbey's medieval cloisters is a space known as the Garth, usually out of bounds to visitors. Today, it's being set up for a special tea party. Smile and cheaply smile. Ah, the rain. <laughs> Another of Scott's fundraising schemes, this time he's enlisted the help of events manager Lorraine. Have the lovely is little flowers okay, edible? Yes, it is. No, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nice. As long as you're still standing in ten minutes, you'll be fine. <laughs> With customers paying handsomely, the tea needs to be extra special. Oh, it's even got a crown on it. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Isn't it pretty? No soggy bottom. No, right. Well, that's <laughs> really good. <laughs> Being in the heart of London. The Abbey is rarely quiet. It's a bit annoying, this helicopter. What's going to start? There's so much security today. They're checking on our bunting efforts. They are. <laughs> the good news. The singer they booked has turned up. Okay, do a little sound check and then we're ready to go. The shopper's going to go soon, hopefully. One, two. One, two. All right. 
But Josephine wasn't expecting to have bells to accompany her performance. We've got the bells at the moment, so yeah. once the bells go, yes, that will be better. They're glorious, not helping. The weather's not helping either. Is that okay? Oh, oh. oh. they haven't come oh. off. Jubilee wind. Their napkins under there. Can you have a look at that? A sudden gust. Come, come. <laughs> I'm going to put the cups on the top. Doesn't look very nice though, does it? Ugh. It's a little bit chaotic in terms of sound levels. We've got the bells going, we have the sound check going, yep. we've got helicopters. We've got gusts of wind. Wind! <laughs> <laughs> and the wind has just blown all the napkins off the tables. Yep, we're ready to go. And after a break in the weather, the guests have arrived. So this is a first for the Abbey to do tea here in the garth in the summer. I've checked the forecast. The forecast um, is clear still. Okay. Um, okay. I think that's a bit. Just got a little bit <laughs> chilly, suddenly. Yeah. We're just thinking of perhaps a wet weather option and picking all the tables up and running into that's where we've got all the run tables to the have north. to go. Yeah, run to the north <laughs> or run to the east. And it's just then that their boss, the Dean, swings by for a spot check. Hi, it's lovely. It is. It's beautifully done, isn't it? It's beautifully yeah. done when the singing and... Isn't it terrific? It's fantastic. Good. And those cakes look to die for me. Good. <laughs> Enjoy it. It just looks so stunning. The, I mean, the catering, the, the crockery, it's beautiful. It, you've really done this proud. Thank, Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot. you. The Abbey's 500-year-old library is also picking up on the Jubilee theme, and Keeper of the Muniments, Matthew Payne, is preparing for a new exhibition of historic documents. Every king and queen of the last thousand years in this country is reflected in them. Being a qualified historian, the Dean wants the chance to see the documents for himself. So we are refreshing our display cases. Mm -hmm removing a selection of items, sort of highlights from the collection that have been on display for a little while and putting in a collection of material relating to 1952-53 and the coronation. The Dean relishes the chance to get up close to some of the Abbey's most treasured artefacts. What have we got in front of us? We have an early writ of Edward the Confessor. The Abbey's role as the Royal Church begins with King Edward the Confessor, way back before the Norman Conquest. Oh so, my word, and that? That is uh, an original seal of Edward the Confessor, of which only two currently survive. Good heavens. So that is about 1065, something mm. like that, just before the Battle of Hastings. The last years of his life, granting land to the Abbey, this time in Staffordshire. And this isn't in Latin, is it? This is in Anglo-Saxon. Good gracious. And this? And this is early 16th century. Yeah. This is a set of accounts for food, um, day by day, what the abbot was eating. A lot of fish involved, a lot of fruit and vegetables, obviously. But on this particular day, which is the 11th of June, 1501, uh -huh. there is a note in the margin that the same day the king uh, dined at Cheney Gates. So this is Henry the Seventh. Henry the Seventh. It was just two years before the new Lady Chapel starts to be built. Oh, so they must have So been they talking. must have been talking about plans for that, presumably. Good grief. That's just breathtaking, Matthew. We are so lucky, aren't we? Mm. <laughs> Matthew's making room for some more recent but equally significant documents. So these are two tickets for the coronation, invitations oh, in nice. 1953 uh, to attend the coronation. One quite relatively plain to the Duchess of Argyle. One a bit more fancy to the Dean's Virgin. Huh? Interesting. Yeah. In 1953, 8,000 people squeezed into the Abbey to witness a young queen being crowned, Her Majesty Elizabeth II. We have the ceremonial notes issued by the Earl Marshal for everyone oh. in attendance, which distinguishes where everyone needed to stand. Like the Abbey services today, everything was planned down to the last candlestick. Oh my word, look at uh, that. At look e at the detail. At each point, you go oh. through where everyone was to be positioned. Now, 
I get things a bit like this occasionally, yes. but it's four or five people yeah. and it's six or seven pages. And this is, and this what is are we, 100 pages? 100 pages, and there, there must be 30 odd names here. The Queen, the Sergeant yeah. at Arms, the Bearer of the Spur, the Bearer of the Second Sword, the Duke of Edinburgh. Look at that. All That's of them with a plan marking exactly where they were to be at each moment. I mean, it was absolutely coordinated to the last minute. And finally, the order of service, complete with annotations. He wasn't going to not spot anything he'd mentioned, you know, where the choir is to join in and so on. And that's exactly what I do. So if I have an order of service like that, I write in it just like that. Just like that. And I write exactly those things. When do I have to move? Where am I moving from? Where am I moving to? And this wonderful phrase, I love this. I here present unto you Queen Elizabeth, your undoubted queen. And, and there's a great acclamation. Yes. God save Queen Elizabeth. And isn't it interesting, we've, we've, we, we saw the way kings shaped this place, Edward the Confessor, Henry III, and now we're actually being reminded how the place also shapes the monarch. Monarch and Abbey were, were, were both kind of in a, in a conversation over a, a thousand years of history. That's it, if you just step in between the bays. Perfect, thank you. Months in the planning, the Jubilee Roof Tours are about to have their world premiere. So if you want to go and have a look, take a photograph, don't hang out too far, because Scott gets nervous. Keep in the zone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The dress rehearsal may have left room for improvement. If there's any questions, I'm really happy that you just stop and shout them out. But it's now make or break time for Ian and Scott, as today they're running the tour for the paying public for the first time. In front of you is Parliament, on the left or hand side here is House of Commons and the break and then into House of Lords. Right, we're going to move into this roof here, it's the eastern roof. After the practice run, Ian was advised to brush up on his Abbey history. The door behind you, or the wall behind you, you can see it's covered in soot and, and slightly damaged. That was from the Blitz, May the 11th, 1941. We were hit by nine bombs. And it seems like he's been doing his homework. One of them went down straight down in the middle of, of the church, but it came down through as an incendiary device, but when it hit the roof, that set that roof alight, and then it, eventually it landed, but luckily it didn't explode. Have Scott and Ian pulled it off? It's time for the public to give their verdict. Oh, it's been fantastic. Absolutely. The two chaps are absolutely brilliant. Knowledgeable and answers every question. It's been incredible. I think they should definitely try to figure out a way to capitalize on it for, for the sake of the Abbey. <laughs> yeah, this tour's been good. You know, it's an amazing experience. It gives me goosebumps coming up here, and I've done three today. <laughs> Inside the nave, people are gathering for the Florence Nightingale service. And for minor canon Bob, who's been rehearsing 30 or so nurses... Come forward. Could I have two of you on this side lining up? A moment of reckoning has arrived. We do end up with that slight little anxiety that most people know what they're doing, but some people have no idea what they're doing. There's nothing you can do at the end of the day. Keep smiling. Keep looking at the watch. Today, before God, we gather to recall the life and witness of Florence Nightingale, the founder of modern nursing. And now it's the turn of Bob's nurses, and this time, the procession is for real. There's only so much you can rehearse, uh, and then the rest of your time is spent coping. I was leaning around a couple of times to see if the processions were actually coming. Because having told them to go really, really, really slowly, I was then really, really worried that they weren't there at all. Um, but actually they did, and I think the timings actually worked really well. I was thinking as I, as I walked and held the lamp, and then all of these amazing nurses around me, and it just, I think it's probably an experience that's going to live with me for the rest of my life.
next time. Cassocks and leather as heaven's angels ride in. My wife's a church warden, so I said I'm coming to head office today. Get a blessing. <laughs> the dean faces the facts. These are the crown jewels. I might be picking one of these up one day. Yeah, that just takes your breath away. And the royals return to the abbey.